Well, hey, uh, welcome back. This is Christian Theology 102, our fourth week of this segment. We had a couple weeks on the Trinity, and uh, now we're diving into how this triune God is at work, and so this is our, our second week looking at creation. Uh, God first makes himself known in Scripture as Creator, and it talks about God, and it talks about the Spirit hovering over the waters, and this God speaks, and through the Word of God, all things came into being. And so, um, from the opening line of the Bible, we see this plurality of, of God, at least hints of his three persons at work in the world. Uh, we talked about last time how God creates ex nihilo, that is out of nothing, um, through the mechanism of his word, the, the, the speaking, the utterance, the word of God is the, the powerful means by which he causes his will to be. So God speaks, he says, let there be, and there is, and it's good. Um, this week we're going to look at some of the um, challenges or difficulties that we face uh, as, we, as we investigate not only Genesis, but, but creation as a whole. And um, I, I want to admit immediately up front that this is not my primary discipline. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a scientist. We're not going to get deep in the science. I, I will speak loosely, and, and I'm sure that um, people who know much more than me, which is a pretty low threshold, could have a lot to correct and amend and clarify, but I'm going to kind of give it the best I've got and we'll, we'll have a conversation. I, and I hope that um, you're having conversations. I know um, some of you are, are part of a, a formal group as we're watching these videos and discussing week by week, and that's great. And I know um, several of you are, are, are watching by yourselves, and, th and that's great too. I'm glad that God's word and teachings are able to reach you where you are, but, but I'd encourage you, if you find these videos helpful and you're, you're um, processing them by yourself, uh, reach out to, to a colleague or a friend or family member and say, hey, I found this little resource. Do you want to watch and have a conversation? Um, I think theology, uh, words about God, um, happens best in conversation and not just in isolated thinking. So uh, today we're going to look at some of the challenges related to creation and uh, a little glimpse of sort of what's at stake. So one of the, one of the challenges we face is what scripture is trying to do versus what scripture is not trying to do. And scripture might have a different goal or motive than we wish it did. Or God, through his revelation, might be trying to communicate something different than we wish he would do. Here's what I mean. In Genesis 1, we see that God is the creator of heavens and the earth and that God intentionally and purposefully and lovingly creates his world, and out of nothing he makes all that there is. And as we see Genesis 1 and 2 flow into Genesis 3, we're going to see that his beloved creatures um, rebel against him, and the world is broken, and then the rest of the story of Scripture is God single-handedly restoring things that are broken. And so, so I believe that, that that's primarily what God is intending to communicate in these opening pages of the Bible. He is the creator. It's a good creation. It's by his design. It's, it's not an accident. He loves people, and it was good, and I know it's broken now, but it will be good as there's going to be a new creation on the last day. I, I think in rough sketches, that's sort of what God is trying to communicate. Uh, God is not primarily telling us things like how old the earth is or um, why did he make mosquitoes? Or, you know, how come certain animals are so strange? And I learned today that the koala bear has a, has a weird bacteria in it because it eats these poisonous leaves, and, and, and yet baby koala bears don't have this bacteria in them, and so they eat the mother's waste for a month. I know, super gross. And they eat the mother's waste for a month so that they can get this bacteria in them which allows them to eat these leaves. Now, why did God choose to do that? I don't know. It, it, was that by design or is that a result of the fall? I don't know. And there's, there's a lot we don't know. So one thing we don't know is exactly what God means by the word day. Um, so the word day, um, or, or yom in Hebrew, um, uh, yom, uh, yom in Hebrew. Um, what what does God mean by? Get rid of my scribbles. What does God mean by by day? So day one, or the first day, and the second day, and the third day. Now in Scripture, day often 
um, means 24 hours, just like we have a day to day. And, and, and some people would say it is a absolutely essential teaching and belief of Scripture that God created the world in six 24-hour windows, and on the seventh 24-hour window, he rested, and, and that has been the 24-hour cycle ever since. And, and could Genesis mean that? Sure. Does it mean that? Maybe. I, I don't know. Um, and, and we see the word day or yom in Hebrew meaning 24 hours a lot in Scripture. But, but, but even in Genesis, even in creation, Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, it says this. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day, yom, that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. So, so even in kind of the, the story, the narrative, the retelling of how God created the world, you have this rhythm of first day, second day, third day, and, and it could be 24-hour periods, or it could be some other period, we don't know. And in chapter 2, verse 4, God says, you know, this is what God did on the day when, when he created the heavens and the earth. And in chapter 2, verse 4, day clearly means kind of the, at the time in which, when God did this, this is what he did. Now, it doesn't tell us exactly when. It doesn't tell us how long ago that was. We, we don't know. And um, I, I, I think many Christians are, are very comfortable with the 24-hour period for each day. I think many Christians say, maybe it's something else. And, and, and I think we have some freedom there. Um, in Gen- or Exodus chapter 20, when, when uh, God's giving the Ten Commandments and talking about the Sabbath day, it, it, it seems to give the, the grounding for our observation of Sabbath in an in initial kind of actual day rhythm. So in six days, God created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested. And so the people of God should rest on the seventh day. And so Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, seems to be drawing a pretty intentional parallel between how we experience days now and the days of creation. Um, St. Augustine, um, writing in the the 5th century, one of the um, greatest thinkers in Western Christianity, so in the 400s or so, um, he he said this in his book, The City of God, which is this massive book that he wrote over years to wrestle with how God works on earth. Um, He said, What kind of days these were, it is extremely difficult or perhaps impossible to determine. So Augustine, um, St. Augustine or Augustine, was comfortable saying, man, what what God meant by day, it's hard to tell. We may never know. Um, And so so we we don't know. Uh, A related um, issue to the days or how long the days were is is the age of the earth. we would like to know how old this world is. Genesis, specifically, and the Bible generally, doesn't try to answer that for us. Um, uh, Plenty of Christians have sought out the answer, and and one of the challenges is that we don't don't know concretely or definitively what what day means in chapter 1. So uh, some people believe it's a 24-hour day, great. Um, other people say, well, maybe these are like ages of the earth. Um, and, and if that's the case, then, then we, we can't kind of date backwards simply by counting six days and then going from there because those days, those days or it could, be, could be massive ages. We don't know. Um, another challenge with dating the age of the earth is that the Christians who've, um, who've tried to date how old the earth is based on the Bible um, end up doing so based on uh, generations or uh, genealogies. Uh, the Bible has lots of genealogies of how um, family lines um, progressed. And one of the um, one of the biggest problems with dating the earth based on genealogies is that the genealogies never claim to be exhaustive. And so 
Um, we, have, we have specific moments like Abraham, um, Abraham was the father of Isaac, who was the father of Jacob, who was the father of Joseph, um, uh, one of the 12 tribes of, of Israel, because Jacob gets his name changed to Israel. So we have, we have kind of itemized family lines in the Bible, but we also have plenty of, of times where, where there's a list of names and, and it you know, might say this person is a son or descendant of that person, but, but it's quite possible that if we double clicked there, you know, if we, if we just zoomed in, like if you're having a map, you know, he got the big map and then there's like the subset, you know, in the one list, it might just say this person was the father of this person, um, but it's, it's quite possible that if we were to zoom in to these two people, maybe, maybe there's tons of generations in between. Um, and, and that fits quite easily with the way the Bible talks about generations. Uh, you, you might have somebody today who uh, has a famous ancestor, you know? They might say something like, oh, you know, we're, we're descendants of Thomas Jefferson or George Washington or Napoleon Bonaparte. And, and you, have, you know, have your friend today and you have Napoleon Bonaparte there and, and they might not tell you and they might not even know all the intermediary steps. They just kind of do the highlights. So there was Napoleon and there's me and you know, those are the important people in our family tree. And so the Bible similarly might just give some of the high water marks or some of the more significant names. And so the, 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 the age of the earth that um, Christians many years ago kind of threw out was based on the assumption that the genealogies were totally exhaustive and fully complete and we could count back generations. And that, that just isn't what the Bible is claiming to do. That's, that's not what its purpose is in telling us generations. Its purpose is to connect the family line, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give us the plot line of how God from the beginning uh, carries about his rescue mission on the earth. Uh, another challenge with the um, uh, story of creation, so we, we have day, we have age. Another challenge is what the Bible means by kind. So God created each animal according to its kind. Um, you may have, have learned about scientific classification when you were, you were in school. I had to memorize this list. And it's one of those things like 80 song lyrics. I just can't forget at this point. Uh, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So there's animal kingdom, plant kingdom, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And it gets more and more detailed. And so we have this um, man-made, helpful classification for how we talk about animals um, and plants and things like that. Well, the Bible doesn't purport to do that. It doesn't give us the same kind of um, species categories, but it talks about how God made each animal according to its kind. Um, and so that could mean a variety of things. So some people think it means specific species, every single species that's available on earth today. Other people might think it's, it means um, there was like a, how are you going to say this? Like I'll, I'll use, again, this is me not being a scientist, just Dan talking. So let's say we had this proto or early like dog species. And, and from that dog species, we now have lots of other kinds of dogs that have kind of uh, developed and adapted and changed, you could say evolved, um, from this initial kind. So it's possible that God made a, a, a dog species, a cat species, um, various bird species, and, and maybe within these there are actually, you know, there's a cat one species and a cat two species, and from these they all um, bred. Uh, even, even today, I, I, um, I visited a, a museum not too many months ago, where they actually talked through some of this, how um, I, I'm, I'm going to make up some animals or well, some breeding for a second, but like a, a chihuahua can breed with a cocker spaniel, which can breed with a golden retriever, which can breed with a domestic wolf, which can you know, breed with a wild wolf. And so um, within a given species, um, by interbreeding, we can see that, that all of these diverse um, animals have a common you know, connection biologically. Um, 
But the Bible doesn't unpack this for us. It doesn't tell us um, the mechanism uh, or the timing of how God created all the various creatures that exist today. And, and so that takes us to the, the, the challenge, the question of, of evolution and how things change. And to, to talk about that well, I think, um, well, number one, I think we need a lot more time and in-face conversation. Um, but, but evolution can mean different things depending on different people. And so uh, the, 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 the book, our, our Mueller text, talks about macro and micro evolution. And I think those are helpful categories. Macro evolution is evolution on a large scale or change among or between or within species on a large scale. And micro means on a smaller scale. And so a micro evolutionary view would say something like, within the species of dog, we have lots of little changes, but it's still dog. Within the species of, of big cats or certain fungi or certain kind of plants or certain kinds of birds, we have um, you know, finches, for example, right? Um, we have all these different kinds of finches, some with bigger beaks and sharper beaks and smaller beaks and, and snubbier beaks and different colors and, and all these different variations within the finch. And yet it's still kind of a finch. And so it's one thing to say all the different kinds of finches have massive variety and tons of change based on their environment. That would be an example of microevolution. Whereas macroevolution would say, I don't know how to draw this, you know, at some point there was just primordial soup, ooze, nothing was alive, and then, you know, some single cell bacteria, something or other, became alive, and it replicated, 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 and then, you know, some tangent over here made lots of replications and changes and variations, and and this one made lots of changes and variations, and this one, and and um, you know this this kind of the idea that from um, from nothing everything came, and it all evolved from on, on massive scale um, from nothing that was alive to the very um, intricate, complex, self-replicating, reproducing species that we have today. So that's kind of a macro view that, you know, all of life or all of mammals came back to this kind of single um, original ancestor. Again, not my primary field. But, but there, is, there is something at, at stake with all this. And it's, it's kind of the, the narrative behind them. Um, and, and to be clear, wanting something to be true or wishing it was true or liking an outcome of one story versus another doesn't make it true. That's not how facts work. But I, I think there are some philosophical underpinnings between um, at, least these, uh, at least two of the worldviews out there. One is the kind of um, atheistic evolution that says nature is all there is and materialism and the earth is all there is and natural laws are at force, and out of that we have life. And that's a different experience of reality or a different worldview than the one that says God lovingly and intentionally and purposely created all things. From the, the naturalistic, um, atheistic evolution point of view, here, here's how life works and, and biology works is, um, you have random mutations. Um, so somehow it had to get started, um, life out of non-life. And, and once things are living, um, at some point those living things um, accidentally develop the ability to reproduce. And eventually those accidentally reproducing organisms um, every now and then there's a glitch in the code, you know, in the DNA, something, um, something randomly changes and, and out of that change, maybe it's better for the thing or maybe it's worse. And if it's worse for the thing, that strand tends to die without passing on 
that same mutation. And if the random mutation is better for the, the thing, species, creature, then it tends to thrive better, meaning it makes more babies, which then in turn passes on that DNA and that mutation. So the mutations that are better keep getting passed on, and the mutations that are worse don't get passed on because those die. And so the, the mechanism by which, um, in, in this atheistic evolutionary point of view, the mechanism by which all life is as it is today is random glitches in the code, and then out of those random mutations, um, the ones that are better lead to more babies being produced, and the ones that are worse lead to um, death and, and less babies being reproduced. And so, um, but, but it's all purposeless and random, and death is this great separator by which the weak are weeded out and the strong prevail. Some, some of my musings or challenges or frustrations, you know, like why I'm like, ah, I, don't, I don't know, like, uh, that seems hard for me. Um, one is, is the idea of random mutations turning out good, and I, I'm, sh I'm sure it happens sometimes, but, you know, if, if you are pregnant or your friend is pregnant and the doctor says, it looks like there's a mutation in one of the chromosomes, your first response is probably not going to be, sweet, I'm going to have a superhuman baby. It's like, oh no, how is this going to be bad? Like when, when, there's a, when there's a random mutation or a genetic distortion in an infant or in an embryo, that usually doesn't mean good news. It usually means this isn't going to work so well. Um, it, it's like if you opened up a, um, some giant HTML document of computer code and you just made a couple changes. Maybe it makes your website better, but probably if you just if you erase a random bit of data or add a random period or colon or, or just a, a miscellaneous line of code or copy and paste it somewhere random in your HTML, it's probably not going to be better. And, and that's kind of the premise by which this whole thing says enough random things happen in the code that it just keeps getting better. Um, and I, we, we don't have a lot of experience of random mutations making things all that better. You know, I'm sure there are some, and again, I'm not a scientist, but that, that's interesting. Um, another interesting, challenging thing is, is it's all kind of neutral and death is good. Death kind of weeds out the bad, and we know who's winning because they're living, and they're better fit for, for their environment. And so, um, you know, I, I think about something like cancer. Um, if you have cancer, how do you think about that cancer, and how does the world think about that cancer? I think we usually speak about it from a Christian point of view, whether we're Christian or not, because the Christian story says God created on purpose, and sin is bad, and deficiencies are bad, and God has a will that people would live. And if something's causing pain and death, that thing is bad, and it's not the way it's supposed to be. But, but in this world, cancer is just evolving. It, it's, it's better adapted than you are. You see, cancer is really good at self-replicating, and it has come to this point where its cells are better than your cells, and cancer cells reproduce and hijack your cells. So the only criteria by which something is good or bad in evolution is, does it reproduce well? And if it reproduces well, it has better mutations that made it more fit and adapted to its environment. And progress comes as mutations win out over other mutations. So in this sense, cancer wins and humanity is doomed because it's just better fit than we are. And you can't say it's good or bad any more than you say like frogs are good and dogs are bad. I mean, there's, there's, it, there's nothing um, inherently valuable about one species or the other according to kind of this atheistic evolutionary point of view. Um, similarly, your value as a human um, or other people's value as humans. Um, the person on the street who, who doesn't have shelter or food or clothing. 
uh, from a purely evolutionary point of view, you know, they just lose. Like, they, they were less fit for their environment than somebody who has a home and shelter and a spouse and children. So, so the only criteria that matters is who's going to pass on their genes to more generations. And, and whatever dies, dies. And whatever lives, lives. And none of it matters because it all came from soup and none of it's going anywhere and there's no purpose behind anything. And, and so, um, kind of, in many ways, we officially teach this as a world. And yet, we also tell our children, you're important and you're special and you matter, you matter, and we should treat other people equally and fairly and in love. And, and, and atheistic evolution says, whoever wins, wins. And whoever is the strongest wins. And, and, and there might be some adaptations by which we, we help the species when we work together. But, but even then, the working together is only a good and valuable thing insofar as it helps the species. And, and once that adaptation no longer serves, then, then the better adapted people are the ones who move on faster. So if, if communal living helped us as a species for a time, great. But, but now that we're stable and we've conquered you know, nature more or less, um, if looking out for number one and killing others is going to help you progress, then that's the most recent adaptation that puts you in the better position to succeed from an evolutionary point of view. And, and, and um, I realize I'm talking fast and very abstractly, but, but, but that's, that's kind of how that worldview goes. And uh, we, don't, we don't function as if that's the world. Um, we might believe that in our textbooks, but we don't teach that to our children, and we don't teach that and live that in society. All that's to say is when we, when we recognize creation as a work of God, it leads to certain conclusions and ways we live, uh, as opposed to if creation came from nothing and has evolved by totally random, meaningless change, and the passing on of genes is the only thing that matters, that will lead to different choices. Um, and again, that, uh, I'm not saying this proves that one is true or the other, but, but I want to invite that reflection of, um, if one of these is true and the other one's not, what does that mean and what, what, what that might that look like? And biblically speaking, the, what, what the Bible teaches is that God created on purpose and life is good and death is bad and all people have worth and value and we should take care of each other. And, and I happen to think that's a pretty good world. Despite the ugliness we see in it, um, God reigns over it. So I look forward to uh, continuing the conversation with you. Uh, I realize this was fast and abstract and way beyond my field. So um, thank you for your grace where I've fumbled through this. And uh, I pray that God, the, the loving creator, would give you glimpses of his majesty and that you would delight in the goodness of his world in, in your very body and, and among um, fellow human creatures made in the image of God throughout this day and throughout this week. God bless.